Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I had a brilliant physicist named Carl Otto Weiss on my podcast this morning. He gave an extremely interesting presentation showing that natural cycles, not CO2, are the likely explanation for the warming since 1850. The audio quality wasn't good, so I'm re-recording the podcast where I will do the best I can to reconstruct what Carl said as we look at his slides. Uh, so, so from here on, this is Carl speaking, Carl Otto Weiss. Uh, in this contribution, I want to show that Earth's climate is determined by three principal cycles, and these turn out to be of solar origin. CO2 has only a minor and unimportant role for the Earth's climate. But before, I would like to mention three official claims on which the whole CO2 story rests and which are manifestly wrong. Here they are. The first thing is, if you go to the scientific literature, you find more than 2,500 investigations which have been published and which show by measurements that the influence of CO2 on Earth's climate is unimportant, um, as opposed, zero works exist which could show on the basis of measurements a substantial influence of CO2 and climate. So the scientific literature and works which are existing are very clear about that. The second point I want to give is a very simple one. The official propaganda claims that only a small amount of CO2 could be emitted before two degrees warming occurs. And this is complete nonsense. If you think of a reservoir which, uh, in which inflow and outflow occur, in such a reservoir, equilibrium occurs at which the filling level of the reservoir uh, is determined by the inflow rate. Not the amount of inflow, but the inflow per unit time. This means we can emit CO2 as long as we want at a constant rate, which means at a certain amount per year or something, and the concentration in the atmosphere will not change at all. And the third point is the official propaganda claims that extreme weather events which cause damage increase with warming. The contrary is correct. The weather becomes more quiet with warming, which has to do with different humidity in the atmosphere in the Arctic range and at the tropic range. Storms increase in autumn. And if you are a student from meteorology, of course, you know that in the first semester. So the opposite of what is officially claimed is correct. So all this, uh, all the basis of the official claims here are simply wrong. Okay, this is just to show you the work that I'm mentioning here has been correctly published and peer reviewed and found correct. So this is just to uh, show you that, that this is serious scientific work. Now, where do we get the Earth's climate from? You see the different colors on this slide. Uh, they refer to what are called proxies, which means temperature representations. And there is one of course missing, which is Antarctica. You'll see pretty much it covers the whole earth. And so we have just taken these measurements, which have been published and constructed as the temperature history for 2000 years. All right, next slide. You see the gray values here. Uh, the scale here is 2000 years as we have reconstructed it from the proxies, which we showed on the previous slide. And you see the gray values are the yearly values of climate. If you take the official definition of climate as the 30 year average of these measurements, uh, that is the blue curve. So the 30 year average uh, is officially defined as climate. What we see here is quite interesting. We see that all the historically known extreme like minima and maxima are represented by the blue climate curve. For instance, you'll see even in details, you'll see very clearly that there is a particular minimum around 1452, which is known from the biography of Louis XI. And you'll see very clearly that this minimum is represented here in the blue curve. And you'll see uh, a maximum at about zero, another one at about 1000 AD, and then another one about 2000 AD. And this is well known. Uh, this was the Roman optimum followed by the medieval, medieval climate optimum, and then the present optimum. So every thousand years, we have a maximum historically. We also see that there are in between around 1500 something, maybe to 1700, uh, between the two most recent maxima, uh, we had the Little Ice Age. So as we uh, find all the historical features of climate, it gives us some confidence that our reconstruction is realistic. With the measurements, the gray measurements in the previous slide, we did something called a Fourier transformation. Basically, that means you're looking for cycles in the data. This is something which every engineer, every physicist applies first um, when confronted with time varying quantities. We were a little bit astonished that in the whole climate literature, there was not a single work on this Fourier process uh, on measurement data. As I said, 
we looked at climate publications and none of them showed what is the normal procedure in every science, apparently apart from climate science. Anyway, we decided, well, if nobody has done that so far, then we will do that. And you'll see it here in this slide, what is called a spectrum. Every one of those big maxima represents a cycle. Uh, so if this is a cyclic or periodic representation of temperature. We have basically three cycles, which we find here. One is 1,000 year. Uh, you remember the last slide, we had these maxima every 1,000 years, which comes from this 1,000 year peak here. The second one is 463. And the third one is the De Vries cycle, 190 years. They're all named after the people who discovered them. And then the De Vries cycle, which is studied very carefully, uh, you'll find it even in Chinese recordings, which have been done for 2,500 years. Okay, so these periods or cycles have already been known from local investigations. So if we find that basically what is already known from local investigations uh, is now determining the global climate, that gives us another confidence that our representation of the climate is realistic. So we have these cycles in what is called the spectrum, okay? Here we have the three cycles in different colors represented in the time domain, not in the frequency domain, as in the spectrum on the last slide. And you'll see the black cycle is the cycle, uh, the thousand year cycle, the eddy cycle. You'll see the maximum of the eddy cycle at zero, at 1000, at 2000, just where the optimum temperatures have been recorded in real life. And you also see from this graph, why is that every thousand years in particular, the temperature is high. It, it occurs because the maximum of these three cycles coincide. So you'll see roughly at age zero, age 1000 and age 2000, the maximum of the black, blue and uh, green cycles at the same time. So they add to make a particularly warm climate. Okay, so this is principal cycles. The three main cycles, which you can see here on the bottom, you add them and you get the red in the graph on the top. As you can see, the red rather well describes the blue and the gray curves. And that means nothing else but the Earth's climate is essentially given by these three cycles. And in particular, if you look at 1900 to 2000, we have this steep increase you see measured in blue, but also the sum of the three cycles gives this increase. So this increase, which is always officially attributed to CO2, is in fact nothing else than the combined effect of the three natural cycles. Okay, at this point, at this point me, Tom Nelson, asked uh, Carl a question. I said, um, the red line goes down beyond the year 2000 in this graph. So these cycles are predicting cooling. And then we're back to Carl talking again. Carl, yes, it does. With a small CO2 warming for about 0.5 degrees uh, per CO2 doubling, you may see that you may overinterpret the data, but if you look at the maximum at zero and at 1000, it is a little bit smaller than our temperature now. And that could be attributed to the small amount of CO2 warming. So at the moment, we do expect a small contribution from CO2. And I would say the difference between the red curve and the blue curve or the gray curve could be, is consistent with this small CO2 influence. It may be over-interpreting it, but at least it's consistent. So I conclude this warming, which is always attributed as due to humans, is not due to humans, but it, it is just an effect of the main natural climate cycles. Okay, this is the main result. Now the question is, of course, you know, I'm a physicist and I'd like to know what it means for something to occur. So what is the reason that we have these three cycles? If you look at this next slide, you see three big maxima. Given is the period of years of the maxima. So you have 207, 499, and uh, roughly 1000. So if we consider that our measurements are not infinitely precise, you would say this is, is exactly what you would expect. The solar activity, which is pictured here, has just these three cycles as the main cycles. Now I should mention this data comes from measurements of solar activity measured by the abundance of carbon-14 and beryllium-10. Uh, this data is for 8,000 years. Uh, likely the three main climate cycles on earth are nothing more than solar activity cycles and the mechanism uh, why the solar activity influences the earth's temperature is well understood. The solar activity, which means solar wind uh, hinders cloud formation. And that means if we have strong solar activity, we have little clouds and it gets warmer and vice versa. Uh, of course, if we have rather small solar activity, it'll get colder. Uh, maybe even a speculative con continuation of the argument is where do these solar cycles come from? 
two years ago, there was the first time it was shown that the tides of the planets, in particular Jupiter and Saturn, are influencing the solar magnetic field. And the solar activity and the effect of the gravitation of these planets is, of course, very small. And so people didn't really think that could be the reason for these solar activity changes. But in this work two years ago, it was shown that what causes the small gravitational inputs to change the solar magnetic field it is what is called a Rayleigh-Taylor instability. I'm a little bit familiar with that because in my PhD thesis, which was on plasma physics, I was fighting with this instability. If we believe the current temperature, you could say that Earth's climate is determined by the position of the planets. I mean, if you say that, the people will tell you, well, this is astrology and not science. Let's say so. The evidence points to the idea that planets really determine solar activity, and the solar activity determines the cloud cover, and the cloud cover determines the Earth's temperature. So in the end, the planets determine our climate. I say this because people would in general be a little bit skeptical about this, but I think it's a very appealing idea. And it is on the side. It doesn't really matter. The question is not really important. The main point is that the cycles are determining the temperature and not CO2. And if we attribute this now to solar activity and to planets, this is just a pretty feature, which appeals to me as a scientist, as a physicist, and everyone can decide if you like the ideas. This is similar work from some Australian colleagues which used a different analysis method. The method we used was looking for cycles and they used what is called neural networks, which are basically programs that can recognize patterns. So what they have done is they have done a similar thing as we did taking measurements from the past. In this case, they have taken the measurements from the past until the year 1850 roughly, and they have software to find the patterns which are there. And with these patterns, then they calculated the temperatures from 1850 to now. See on the left in blue, the proxy measurements and in orange is the reconstruction by the patterns which the neural network recognized. And you can also see from 1850 to 1900, there's this steep increase and the neural networks again reproduce completely this increase. And one notes again that the patterns are determined from the time when CO2 apparently was not strongly emitted. So it's again proof that natural effects are causing this increase from 1850 to now, which is always taken as the single proof of CO2's effect on climate. This is just to show that we're not alone with this, this result. The temperature is determined by natural things rather than by CO2. Basically, this is the whole story. My main message is that we find that the three main cycles determine the Earth's temperature and not CO2. And that is also confirmed by measurements. Just some extra things here. This is a graph which shows uh, published climate sensitivity estimates. Climate sensitivity means always how much temperature increase do we get when we double the CO2 content of the atmosphere. And as you see, initially around the year 2000, the sensitivity was large, so that a little CO2 caused a big temperature increase. Over the years, you see that the estimates come down and the values are now more like in the half degree range. Initially, the effect of CO2 was supposed to be very strong, but recently all estimates are more in agreement with what we find. The effect of CO2 is very small. And of course, the official claims should have this in mind. I mean, this is the published literature, but of course they still claim that the CO2 effect is much larger. This is an interesting thing. Officially, it's always claimed that the industrialized countries have caused the CO2 content of the atmosphere to rise. If you look at the some works, which are cited by some, say the propaganda, sometimes they say the CO2 never disappears after it goes up or it lasts 100 years or something in the atmosphere. This is the reason why countries say, well, the industrialized countries are the ones who cause this trouble, therefore they have to pay. This is just nonsense. Now it's difficult to see how CO2, once it is emitted, how it disappears. I mean, it clearly disappears in the biological sphere for the CO2 is food. And of course, a lot of the CO2 uh, goes into the sea and is dissolved. Now the question is, can we somehow measure how the CO2 disappears once it's emitted? Normally you cannot distinguish which CO2 is natural and which might be emitted by humans. The only way is to have different kinds of CO2. And this was the case here. So you see here, the green points rise very steeply around 1960. And this was due to the nuclear tests, which were done. The CO2, which was measured in this curve is the radioactive CO2, C14. And that comes largely from the atmospheric tests of nuclear weapons. Now, as you see, as soon as the tests stopped, the uh, CO2, this type of CO2 goes down let's say a half time of about six years. 
and it's not infinity and it's not a hundred years. And so it means the claim that the industrial nations are responsible for the present CO2 in the atmosphere is just wrong because the CO2 is very short lived. You can see it here from this graph, which graphs carbon 14 from the nuclear tests. So this is just something where again, the official claims are just contrary to measurements. Uh, this is something which you see very often of simulations, which officially are describing the temperature. And of course the simulations differ. So the red line is a mean of all these different simulations and different calculations. And as opposed, you'll see the green are the measurements of the temperature. And to understand that around, the, around 1979, the models were adapted to the measurements. So they were artificially normalized to the measurements. That is why around 1980, the measurements and the red curve do not vary by much. But as you see over time, the red curve very much overestimates the real temperatures. This is just to show that the models on which all official claims rely on are simply not correct. Okay, I guess that was it. On this next slide, there's another kind of the same thing, just a different set of data, but it shows the same thing. The average of the models is very, very much overestimating the actual temperature that resulted. At this point, I asked Carl how he became a skeptic. Uh, here was his answer. Even in 1990, I mean, I'm a physicist. I had a working group, uh, four working, working groups, 10 people each. I had 10 of these scientists on projects, which means I had to find about 1 million euros to feed these people which means even though we understood very well that there were contradictions in the official statements, it was all very fishy. But of course, I never had time to look into that. So only when I retired, which is now 15 years ago, I said, well, okay, um, now it's time to see what's really going on. Are the official claims correct or not? And so what I did first, that was around the year 2010, was just to try to do models as everyone does. And I very quickly realized that the way the climate models work is very primitive. What you see officially is that people take 10,000 equations and throw them on a supercomputer. What comes out is chaos and nothing else. If you have 10,000 equations, I mean, it means you have so many things which you have to assume. So there's a lot of uncertainty. There's no argument about what the CO2 itself does. CO2 itself has a small effect. Even the IPCC agrees with that. The official models then introduce what they call the water vapor amplification. So they say, well, yeah, it's warmer. There's more water coming out of the oceans. And water is a very strong climate gas that will increase the warming by a factor of five to 10. I mean, this sounds plausible, but there have been analyses of water content in the atmosphere, which show the opposite. All right, that's the end of my Carl Otto Weiss podcast. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe.